Hey, it's Amber. If you need a quick pick-me-up while on your break at work or to start your day or while your kids are napping, tune into Grace Talks. You'll hear pastors talking about relevant issues like fear, anxiety, and grief. They're short but powerful messages. Find Grace Talks wherever you listen to podcasts. Today's episode is called Keep Customers Happy, but not at the expense of your soul. So we are in week three of the topics that Office Max gave me. Thank you very much. Of course, they didn't add the part about the expense of your soul. But we are talking, after all, about Christianity. So that's where we're headed today. Hey, guys, it's Amber, wife, mother, warrior, type A child of God. Here at Little Things, we examine everyday issues from a biblical perspective with one simple goal, to know and love God more. Thanks for joining me. Jesus said, what good is it for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. I wrote that down today and I thought, ooh, it almost sounds like Jesus was talking to us today. In this wicked and adulterous generation, And that is a stark warning. If you're ashamed of me, I'm going to be ashamed of you when I come back. I don't want to be in that situation. What do we give in exchange for our souls? You know, if we think about it, we give ourselves to so many things that have no value whatsoever in the whole scheme of things. The time that we spend on our phones scrolling, the time that we spend in front of the TV, watching things that don't really matter, the time that we spend down at the bar, hanging out, just being part of the crowd, the effort that we put into being accepted in the world, whether it be the time that we spend on our hair and makeup or the time that we spend making TikToks or getting our body in the right shape or, you know, finding the right dress for this event or, you know, we spend so much time on stuff that doesn't matter. And you know, it can happen not just in our homes, but just as easily at the Christian day school or at the church. And that's what I want to get into today. I'm not trying to be condescending. I'm not trying to attack the people who are working really hard in God's kingdom. I just want us to really make sure that we're on the right track. And I see that it's so easy to get distracted and to go the wrong way. And so again, this is not meant to criticize our called workers who work so hard and give their lives. However, it may be just a letter, a little bit of a, hey, guys, let's make sure we're still on the right track, doing what we want to do for the reasons that we want to do it so that we can be using our time, effort, money in the best way possible. Because it's super easy to get distracted for all of us. How does that happen at the Christian day school or even in our lives if our children go to public school? Well, we can be spending our time you know, running the concession stand and working for the school board and raising money for this or that and being busy doing all the things like Martha, distracted with a million things that are good. I'm not saying any one of those things is bad. Not one of those things is bad unless it comes at the expense of time with God And at the expense of spending time at Jesus' feet. Because Jesus told Martha, you are worried and distracted about many things, but Mary has chosen what is better. And that's what this is all about. Making sure that we're on the right path. Making sure that distraction hasn't taken us away from where we want to be. How do we keep people happy? Our church workers the people who attend our Christian day school, the people who attend our preschool, 
the people who attend our church, our neighbors, our friends, our kids, our grandkids, our children. Who? How? What do we do? Teach the word. Go deeper into the word. Do not be distracted from that. I was reading Psalm 63 this morning, and it starts like this. Oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My body longs for you in a dry and weary land where there is no water. Do you know what you need in the desert? When your mouth is parched and your tongue is sticking to the roof of your mouth, when you're faint and about to drop, guess what you need? Yet water. It wouldn't do you any good to, you know, get a towel or to, you know, get a bicycle if you're about to die of thirst. What is it that we earnestly need more than anything else? We need God. Jesus told the woman at the well, whoever drinks the water that I give will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman at the well is proof that you can be at the source of water and miss it completely. You can still be dying of thirst. It is possible. And this is so incredibly sad to me. It is possible to be in a Christian setting. To be raised in a Christian family, to go to a Christian school, to attend a Christian church, and miss the message of Christ. It is possible to be in these places and never have a relationship with Christ. I was talking to a young man the other day. I think he's in his early 20s. And he was telling me about his church growing up. And all I could think is, man, you got religion, but you never had a relationship with Jesus. You were taught a lot of do's and don'ts. That's morality. Jesus, mm, nope, missed him altogether. That is horrifically sad. If we have all the programs, we have Trunk or Treat, we have Easter for Kids, we have Christmas for Kids, we have VBS, we have projects, we have songs, we have fun, we decorate cookies, but somehow miss the word of God, those cookies aren't going to last. The projects are not going to bring them to know their Savior. I know I am not trying to slap anybody across the face here. I've worked in Sunday school for 15 years. I get it. When you do a project, the idea is to solidify whatever it is that the story was about. I get it. But you know what? 15 years ago when I became Sunday school superintendent, the first thing I did was quit spending money on projects. And this is why. Because half of the time that we had to teach the story was spent gluing things on something else, taking a craft home that was going to get thrown away in two weeks. And this is what I really wanted. I wanted to put the word of God in the kids' hearts. And that takes takes time. It takes time to apply the lessons, to help the children to feel what the disciples felt on that boat that was tossing in the wind and the waves. It takes time to help the kids understand what Joseph must have felt when he was far from home and in prison for doing the right thing. But this is the thing. The kids are going to find themselves in both of these situations in not very much time. They will find themselves feeling all alone for doing the right thing if they choose to walk with God. They will find themselves 
in circumstances that seem like they are going to overtake them and maybe even possibly lead to their death if they live long enough. How about Jacob when he was on the run because he had tricked his dad for the blessing? So he had to escape because Esau was about to kill him, or at least he said he was going to kill him. Do you think it's possible that the kids at some time in their life are going to feel the consequences of the sins that they committed? And they're going to find themselves alone in a pit that they have dug for themselves? And what happened? God met Jacob on that trip. Angels were ascending and descending into heaven. God showed himself to be real, that he would be with Jacob, even though Jacob had just done this terrible thing of tricking his own father, ruining his relationship with his brother. And God still said, I'm going to be with you. David says in Psalm 63, Your love is better than life, and my soul will be satisfied as with the richest of foods. Really? Is that how we feel about God? Because if that's the way we feel about God, that's what we're going to be teaching, and that's what people are going to find. They're going to find that relationship with God that will last them through the horrific, the trying, the troubled times of life, through the times When they are at the end of their rope and they don't know how to go on, that's how we're going to do it, by really showing people God, by letting them see Jesus when they come into our midst. Satan loves to convince us that the word isn't all that exciting. Do you know why? Because he knows how powerful it is. The word is life-changing. You will find the power to overcome your sins. You will find the courage to overcome your fears. Not in the latest self-help book. Oh, you might find it there, but that won't last. But you're going to find it in the Word of God, the true, living, active Word of God. And can you think of anything that would make people happier than realizing that God gives them advice for their marriage, that he teaches men and women about relationships? Read about Jezebel. Read about Herodias. Read about them and figure out, find what God says about tricking your spouse into doing something or manipulating to get your way and how it makes your spouse feel. Contrast that with Ruth. Look at Sarah. What happened to her relationship when she manipulated to get a son? How do we raise our kids to be in the world but not of the world? It's in the Bible. Read Jeremiah. He didn't fit in. Read the first six chapters of the book of Daniel (laughs) about how time and time and time again, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego ended up on the other side of popularity. They were odd man out over and over and over. You want to be in the world, but not of the world. Look at their accounts. You'll see how to do it. Look at Daniel. I mean, David in all throughout 1 Samuel. Look at Joseph in the end of Genesis, and what he experienced. Everybody is looking for answers. And yes, there are lessons to be learned in sports. Absolutely. There are good things that you can find in all kinds of activities. But true and lasting satisfaction is found in the word, and that is something that the church can give that no one else does. Joel Patchen said, we can trust God's word to be the absolute authority in all matters of life because it is the very words of Almighty God, written through human vessels, inspired by the Holy Spirit. David continues with Psalm 63, and he says, on my bed, I remember you. I think of you through the watches of the night because you are my help. I sing In the shadow of your wings, my study Bible notes that this is a metaphor for protection against the oppression and the protective outreach of God's power. Do you think that people are going to need that in their life when they're facing cancer, when they're facing persecution, when coworkers are rising up against them? 
This is how we arm our people to face the world and Satan and their sinful nature. This is how we keep our customers, quote unquote, aka the people of God, eternally happy. Get them in the word. Show them the richness of the word and how it applies to them. In the book of Hebrews, chapter 12, we read, Therefore strengthen your feeble arms and your weak knees. Make level paths for your feet so that the lame may not be disabled, but rather healed. We have a lot of weak and feeble and disabled people coming through the doors of our churches and our schools and our preschools into our youth groups. Oh, we like to put on our happy faces. We like to pretend as if we have it all together. But you know what? The church is where? We can help people to strengthen their arms. How do we do that? We hold them up. They've got feeble arms. Great. We will come behind that you and help you hold up whatever burden you are carrying. How do we strengthen weak knees? By getting people, be- getting behind people and helping them to stand when it is all they can do to stand. How do people find healing? They find that in Jesus. Jesus is the balm that will heal any wound. And there's one place that they find it, and that's in the Word of God. They find Jesus every time they get into the Word. That's why, people, we have to make this our priority. We have to be in the Word, and we have to make sure that above anything else, you may or may not get into the project. And you may or may not get to the food, but make sure that people, when when they walk through the doors of your church or your school or your preschool, make sure that they hear the word of God. How do we make level paths? Well, you got to smooth out the bumps. You chisel away at the sins because our sins can cause other people to stumble. If I'm a gossip, I might be leading other people astray. Me talking about other people may cause them to fall or fall away completely. If I'm an alcoholic and I'm in the church and I want to get people together for drinks at my house, I may lead somebody into a path of alcoholism. Listen, we have to smooth out the bumps. We have to chisel away at our sins because we don't want to be the stumbling blocks. We want to fill in the valleys. We want to tackle our weaknesses. If procrastination is a problem for us, we really need to get a grip on this in the church. Because if we say, oh, you know, we're going to start Bible studies in September, but then we procrastinate, we're not ready, so then we're going to start in October, but we never get around to it. Then we'll start in January. Well, that didn't work. We'll just push it back to May. We may never get around to starting those Bible studies. And that's not helping your people. And if you're teaching Sunday school and you keep putting off preparing your lesson until finally a few minutes before class, you just quickly glance at it, you're really doing a disservice to the children you are meant to serve. We have to fill in the valleys. We have to tackle our weaknesses. We need to make God a priority. Listen, it's not going to matter if you watch another three or four episodes of Criminal Minds. It is going to matter if you're prepared to teach. Those children need to know about God. People need to know about God. We have to make this a priority. I know that we're working. I know that we have busy lives and a lot of the things that we're doing are really, really good and there's nothing wrong with them. And don't misunderstand that. There are so many blessings and so many ways to spend time. But the one thing that we can offer that people aren't going to find other places is the word of God and a deeper relationship with Christ. And we don't want people to miss that. How are we going to keep our customers happy? We're going to do that as we bring them to Jesus. That's our job. 
That's how we keep our family happy. Look, I don't care what you have going on because I know that we're all busy. I have four kids living in my house. I I get it. Make time for devotions. I have a friend who decided that her evenings are just too crazy. My family, we do devotions at night. But she said to me, Amber, I tried and, you know, it just doesn't work because I'm in too big of a hurry. So she decided to get her family up 15 minutes earlier. And before they head out the door in the morning, they have a devotion and prayers. And she said it's working brilliantly. We got to do this in our families, guys. We got to make this a priority. Not because that makes us so much more special in God's eyes. We do it because we're arming our family to meet the demands of the day, the night, the next week, everything that's coming at it, at them, and to arm them to do it, to meet these things with God and the power and the help that he offers. That's why. So please think about this. Don't get distracted. Don't let your distraction take you away from time with God because that's where it's at. The happiness that you are going to experience in life, the joy that's going to lead you through all the struggles and all the hard times, guaranteed, guaranteed you're going to find that when you spend time with Jesus. This has been Little Things because in God's kingdom, the little things are the big things. If you're a faithful listener, would you rate and review Little Things? They're so much vying for time and attention, and reviews and ratings really do make a difference as to what people see. Let me thank you in advance, and don't hesitate to reach out. If you have a suggestion, I am so happy to hear from you. Thanks for being here.